Dana Rosario. I'm a Tua and the chair of BALSA. I'll be moderating today's event, which is part three in a series of community forums focusing on racial justice and policing. We're honored to have Alec Karakasanis join us today to discuss his book, Usual Cruelty, The Complicity of Lawyers in the Criminal Injustice System. Alec is also the founder and executive director of the Civil Rights Corps, an organization designed to advocate for racial justice by bringing <clears throat> civil rights lawsuits on behalf of indigent people. We also have our very own Professor Meltzner, who's a Matthews Distinguished University Professor of Law, joining us to provide commentary on Alec's book. Once Alec and Professor Meltzner finished their discussion, we will then open it up to questions. So I ask that you please submit your questions in the chat feature as we've muted everyone for this event. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Alec. Thank you so much, Danae. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you um, to Rachel and for helping to organize this and for um, Professor Meltzner for um, what I hope will be a really wonderful discussion about the ideas that, that are implicated in the book and, and beyond. And I'm grateful for everyone's time. And I hope we can have a robust discussion with everyone after we're done. I, I've been thinking a lot this morning in particular um, about one of the stories that I told in the introduction to the book. Um, as many of you might have seen last night, there was a New York Times story that talked about the role of top federal government officials, including the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General in the program to separate um, immigrant parents from their children um, that horrified the nation a couple of years ago. And I've been thinking a lot about the outrage on Twitter and in social media about uh, the role of, of these bureaucrats, many of whom um, uh, up and down the, the chain of command in the U.S. Attorney's Office and the DOJ um, are, are Democrats, many of them are Republicans, sort of it's a, sort of a bipartisan affair, our, our horrific immigration system. And I, I've been thinking a lot about the story of Christy Don Barden, um, and the book is um, actually dedicated to Christy and to three other women who I represented who were trapped in a cage because they couldn't make a monetary payment and who um, subsequently died while we were representing them in their civil cases and their civil rights cases. And um, I, I thought about the, the morning that I met Christy uh, in a small jail cell in Clanton, Alabama. Um, and she had been too poor to afford a couple hundred dollars in money bail um, based on a shoplifting charge from Walmart. And because she couldn't make that payment, she was separated from her two young children. And if she had been just a little bit more wealthy to pay a little bit of money to a for-profit company, she could have been out and she would have known where her children were. And um, she was so distraught by this, I, I wrote in the book, um, that she was screaming and crying uncontrollably. And, um, People in the jail um, took her out of her cell and took her down the hallway where they keep a chair outside of the view of cameras as they do in so many jails all over this country. And they strapped her into a restraint chair and they tased her body over and over again. And that morning that I met her, I took photographs of all of the taser wounds. And, um, and Christy said to me that morning, um, as it turned out just a few weeks before she passed away, um, I want to bring this case um, because I don't want any other woman to ever have to go through what I've just gone through just because we can't make a payment. And um, she did something very courageous. She became really the first person to challenge on equal protection and due process grounds the American money bail system since the rise of mass incarceration. And just a few weeks later, the same Department of Injustice that I write about in the book um, that separated children from their families at the border came in and wrote a statement of interest in her case, agreeing with her arguments that it was unconstitutional to keep her in a jail cell just because she couldn't make a payment prior to trial. Um, and that sort of kicked off my own involvement um, over the last six years in trying to dismantle and abolish this 
country's system of pretrial human caging and all of the attendant um, profit-making enterprises that go along with pretrial detention and pretrial supervision and surveillance of the poor and, and, and particularly disproportionately black communities. Um, and so I've been thinking a lot about, about Christie because um, all of the outrage that's been expressed about um, the Trump administration's separation of children and families, um, I think can and should and will be directed at the system of mass incarceration, the system of pretrial detention, um, the system that keeps um, parents separated from their children in 3,163 local jails all over this country, usually solely because they're too poor to afford a monetary payment. Um, and so we're at a moment of, I think, real possibility. Um, and one of the things that's been exciting about our work in the last few years has been the way in which our culture has um, started in, for the first time since I've been really following and working in these issues um, to appreciate the cruelty and senselessness of the entire punishment bureaucracy. On the other hand, the reason I was compelled to, to publish the book um, and something that has been um, really um, worrying me the last few years is that um, many of the same interests, financial interests, um, government interests, um, racial interests um, that created the system of mass incarceration, that created things like the cash bail system are still in power and still dominate decision-making around all of these issues and will try uh, with all of their energy and sophistication to reproduce many of the same mechanisms of oppression with different labels under the guise of criminal justice reform. And I think it's, it's very telling that many of the people who built their entire careers off of mass human caging with no discernible benefit, um, people like I write about in the book, Preet Bharara, Sally Yates, Kamala Harris, Eric Holder, many of whom are now uh, you know, resistance heroes in the age of Donald Trump, um, Joe Biden, and others. Um, the, these people, I believe, um, will try to um, preserve as much as, as possible of the architecture of this bureaucracy um, while trying to ensure that they maybe um, shave off some of its most grotesque flourishes in an attempt to undermine movements to, that are sort of geared at a much more radical dismantling of it. And I think these are pretty sophisticated adversaries. One of the things that, that, um, that I think about the most with respect to um, the challenge that we face is what recently happened in California. After we won a constitutional challenge that struck down California's money bail system, in the case of my client, Kenneth Humphrey, um, we saw the, the forces of mass incarceration and the bureaucracy mobilize in really unprecedented ways. Um, so Mr. Humphrey's case, the court said some very simple things, the Court of Appeal in California. Uh, it said in a unanimous decision, if you set a financial condition of release that someone can't pay, what you're actually doing is detaining them. Um, it seems very simple. A lot of non-lawyers have no trouble grasping that concept. Um, and so if, for example, I come before the court and the court says, I'm going to release you prior to trial, but you have to run a one minute mile. What the court is actually doing is saying they're detaining me because there's no chance that I'm going to run a one minute mile. The same is true if they say I'm going to release you if you hand me a billion dollars or a million dollars or for many of my clients, $500. So that was a very simple um, holding. Um, it, it caused shockwaves throughout California. Um, and one, one good thing that happened was in the wake of the death of Khalif Browder and the death of Sandra Bland and, and much of the public attention around the money bail system, California's Democrat controlled legislature passed a bill eliminating the money bail industry and eliminating the use of, of money bail altogether in California. Um, at first glance, this was a really great opportunity. We worked with a number of advocates and civil rights organizations and community organizers and base building groups all over California. And we helped draft a bill um, that would replace California's money bail system. 
At the last minute, um, many of the most prominent uh, representatives of the punishment bureaucracy led by uh, the Ju Judicial Council of California, controlled by the Chief Justice, um, they convinced the governor to remove all of the content of the bill that we had drafted and to replace the content with a bill they had drafted, which also eliminates uh, the secured money bail industry, but replaces it with a dramatically expanded system of pretrial detention and surveillance and supervision. And contemplates not only expanding pretrial detention, um, but uh, delaying people's right to a bail hearing for up to two weeks and um, requiring everyone to, to use uh, risk assessment algorithms to determine um, who is detained and who is not. And dramatically, by what could be tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars a year, expands um, the probation industrial complex. And this is how they got SEIU, the prominent union, to be one of the major supporters of the bill because they represent California's probation officers. And so um, once you create that many union jobs as probation officers, it's going to be very, very difficult to ever dismantle it, what Michelle Alexander has called the rise of e-carceration, um, where many of the people who are going to be released are now going to be released with a GPS monitor and an ankle bracelet and drug testing. And what's fascinating is that many of the same companies that are invested in the bail industry, that are um, the private prison companies, the prison telecom companies like Securus and GTL, they've interestingly all been purchasing GPS and surveillance companies for, for pretrial probation and parole supervision. There's really a, a kind of a capitalist bonanza going on in this world, um, shifting some of their primary investments from um, uh, solely focused on human caging to now focused on um, tracking and surveilling and monitoring and controlling black communities and communities of color. And there's actually a lot more money to be made in it. Um, in addition to Securus and, and Geo Group, the telecom and, and prison conglomerates respectively, the other large companies in this area, with one of whom just signed a multi-million dollar contract with San Francisco uh, in the wake of SB 10, um, are two Israeli defense contractors. Um, so this is a global um, move uh, by certain um, profit-seeking interests. Um, why do I bring that up here? Well, um, one of the things that's really bad about the California Money Bill Reform Law is that it dramatically expands the punishment bureaucracy. It contemplates putting more and more people into it, which means that there's more and more ways for more and more companies to make money off of it. Obviously also a huge concern is that many, many more people in the public sector are gonna have a vested interest in preserving that system. I mentioned the probation officers, but the same is true of, of many of the other jobs that are gonna be attended to when you dramatically expand punishment bureaucracy. This reminds me uh, quite a bit of what happened um, in the first federal bail reform movement of the 1960s. It was a movement led largely by white, wealthy male lawyers, um, including Bobby Kennedy when he was attorney general. And then after his assassination was picked up by uh, groups of federal judges and other prosecutors. And eventually they, they succeeded in um, eliminating um, the cash bail system from federal courts with the Federal Bail Reform Act of 1984. But that act also created a system of pretrial detention. And on the day that act was, was enacted, uh, the, the rate of detention in federal courts in this country was about 24%. So it was a big problem. About, about a quarter of all human beings charged with a federal offense were too poor to pay cash bail. So they got rid of cash bail. And 36 years later, as I'm talking with you today, the pretrial detention rate in federal court is 72.4%. So we got rid of the problem of wealth-based pretrial detention, but we tripled actual pretrial detention. And the people charged with crimes in federal court are more disproportionately black and more disproportionately poor than they were at the time of that act. So the reform that, that many um, sort of liberal elite uh, legal actors and, and bureaucrats led has actually dramatically worsened the very problems that they set out to address. And one of the themes of, of the book is that um, it really questions the role of lawyers, number one, um, in, in how we might achieve social change in a, in a country in which the courts and lawyers have never been at the radical vanguard of, of social change in any of the major social movements. But number two, um, how do we think about um, dramatically changing these systems 
without thinking about building power um, to demand that these systems change. Because if you think like I do, that the legal system is really a, an arena where existing power relationships, economic, racial, gender, um, play out um, uh, with the veneer of doctrine and law, um, then what your real focus should be if you're looking to dismantle those systems is building enough power um, to change the underlying um, power struggles that are being manifested um, uh, above ground, um, so to speak, in the law. And so that's why uh, with all of our work, um, we are trying very much to think about um, how can we be part of a social movement, a social movement that changes the way that our society thinks about human caging, it changes the way our society thinks about public safety and interrogates the story that we've been told by police, by prosecutors, by judges, by powerful politicians about what is safety in our communities. Um, is safety um, a society in which um, many, many uh, millions of people are being sickened by the air that they're breathing and children are drinking water poisoned with lead and many people are unable to get basic health care. Um, is that public safety? Is, it, is a system of public safety one in which tens of millions of families disproportionately black are being separated from their children, um, largely because of their possession of plants that are uh, on a list of plants the government says they can't possess? Is our, 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 our notion of safety where people can't get basic mental health treatment or live in, um, uh, affordable houses um, while other people hoard multiple properties and, and wealth. So these are the kinds of, of problems that we um, have uh, sort of been ignoring in much of the criminal justice reform conversation. Much of that conversation is led by people who pretty much like the way that our society looks. And so their, their solutions for reforming the criminal punishment bureaucracy are a few little tweaks here or there, like slightly lower sentences here and better use of force policies by the police there. Um, and, and, and not, um, what would it look like if we had a society that was so much more radically meeting people's needs that there was um, not much of a need for punishment or policing or cages or handcuffs or prisons. And that's, that's sort of the, I think the, the, one of the big differences between um, the people that I, I see as leading the defunding the police movement right now and the people that I see of as sort of reformist reformers, um, some people think we can fix the problems of the criminal legal system in a silo. And people think the problems that we're trying to address in the criminal punishment bureaucracy are deeply tied to our society's divestment from safe housing and, and medical care and mental health care and environmental pollution um, and economic deprivation and inequality. And of course, um, perhaps first and foremost, to our society's horrific failure to acknowledge and reckon with the history of white supremacy um, and the way in which um, the, the system of chattel slavery that existed at the, at the time of this country's founding has permeated every single aspect of every single institution going forward, um, including who owns things and who doesn't own things. Um, I'll also mention the, um, the, what, what is often not discussed very much in these circles, which is the, the theft of indigenous lands and the ways in which our conceptions of who, what it means to own something and, and what it means to exclude somebody else from that thing that we own are so tied up in that history of colonial conquest and are so also tied up in our modern understandings of what we want the police to do. I was, I'll, the last thing I'll say before I'll, I'll turn it over to, to, to Professor Meltzner um, is there's one other sort of common thread that you see among the, the sort of reform, more reform, uh, less abolitionist minded um, bureaucrats now is the focus on the progressive prosecutor. Um, now, I think that focus sometimes comes from a good place because they, people look at the criminal system and they see how powerful prosecutors are. Um, I think, you know, my own theory 
is that prosecutors have only become really powerful in our legal system because over the rise of mass incarceration, they've used that power against powerless people, against black people, against poor people, um, against the LGBTQ community. Um, and, and so um, if you were to see prosecutors uh, doing the opposite, attempting to use their power against powerful people and not against those groups, I think you'd find that prosecutors have a lot less power than, than we all think they do. I was doing a podcast for maybe the most prominent progressive prosecutor now, Chesa Boudin in San Francisco. And I said to Chesa, you know, it's great that you, and Chesa's an old, old friend of mine and, and was actually my co-counsel on the, the bail case I mentioned in California before he ran for DA from the public defender's office. Um, I mentioned to him, what would happen if you said, we've got a, a huge problem in San Francisco with, with um, people who don't have homes, with um, poverty. Uh, we also have a huge problem with wealth hoarding. There's lots of tech billionaires. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, anyone who has an extra house that, that's not their primary residence, um, uh, and, and there's anyone who doesn't have a house, they can just go into that, that extra house of the tech billionaire. Um, and um, so long as you don't have a place to go, and so long as you have multiple properties, I'm not going to enforce trespassing laws in San Francisco. And I gave that thought experiment to him because I think it's worth noting that if he attempted such a thing, he would immediately become the least powerful person in San Francisco. The entire community would turn on him, uh, not just the police, but, but um, progressives, people who own land, own property, uh, who want to exclude poor people from their property who want to exclude black people and indigenous people who, who used to own uh, that property um, and who, and there's been a relentless effort uh, among white powerful people over the last hundred years, even since, um, since the, the end of, of the reconstruction period um, to extract black wealth in a variety of ways. Um, and, and so having extracted all of that wealth, people want to use the police to exclude people from it. And that's a hard truth. Um, it's, I don't even think it's quite a radical thing to say, just to acknowledge that if district attorneys tried to address some of these really difficult social problems, instead of just processing people through the criminal system, even, even if, if Chesa Boudin, um, for example, um, stopped prosecuting people for drug offenses, there'd be enormous outcry, right? Um, because our society isn't set up to give people the treatment and the health care that they need. And prosecutors can't make those investments. All prosecutors can do, and I think this is still important, is be less cruel. Um, and, and so I'm all for that. I'm not opposed to prosecutors being less cruel and, and to, uh, using some of their discretion to investigate the crimes of the wealthy. Um, but what I'm pointing out is that these problems are a, a much deeper uh, set of issues that connects to the way that our economy and the way that our history of white supremacy function. I think I'm going to pause there because I want to make sure we have as much time as possible for the commentary and, and the questions. So thank you so much um, for having me and I'm looking forward to, to hearing what people's thoughts are. Again, uh, congratulations on the book, which I just want to show the audience as best I can. Um, uh, and um, for writing such a powerful indictment of the justice system from bail to jail and police to prosecutors to judges and prisons. And most of all, making clear that the present policies won't be changed without a larger focus on economic inequality and, and uh, racism. Um, I'll try and be brief because uh, I agree, I'd like to um, give the audience a chance for questions and, and for Alec to respond. Now, these are, are, are long-standing uh, and persistent problems. Uh, a personal example, you mentioned the 1960s bail reform. Um, with my colleagues at the NACP Legal Defense Fund and the National Office for the Rights of the Indigent, we actually brought a constitutional challenge to the money bail system to the Supreme Court in 1968. Um, the justices uh, refused to review the case, uh, Justice Douglas was a dissenter to the denial of cert. Anybody interested in that particular story, it's in a book I wrote called With Passion. Um, the case is called Gonzalez um, v. Warden. 
Um, and um, I think your description of what happened to bail reform is, is quite apt. One of the interesting things about your approach is that you seem to vote more reformers than to right-wing zealots uh, in uh, Usual Cruelty, which by the way is a wonderful title, uh, ha having spent many years dealing with the Eighth Amendment, I, I truly appreciate your title. Um, yeah, I mean, you take on, as you said, Kamala Harris, Eric Holder, and progressive prosecutors for not doing enough. Now, I don't disagree with your, most of your critiques, but it does raise the question of how we move from uh, indictments and rhetoric to actual change. Um, in Massachusetts here, um, the legislature has been deadlocked for over uh, a month over a modest reform to qualified immunity. In California that you referenced, um, uh, the legislature uh, adjourned without passing any serious police reform. Uh, these are the, you know, two of the most liberal states in the nation. Apparently it's politically difficult to get reforms, much less the transformative changes that you properly are seeking. So I'd like to hear your comments uh, on, on this. Um, secondly, usual cruelty includes a small list of the sort of interventions you favor and presumably, I, I guess they serve as models for future change agents. Uh, Worker-owned, you, you reference worker-owned co-ops, stopping new jail construction, uh, reserving marijuana licenses uh, for communities that were previously targeted for drug arrests, more affordable housing, reparations for people uh, subjected to police torture, alternatives to money bail. It, it's a worthy list, but I just don't find any of these approaches will lead to transformation. So again, the question is, um, given the politics, uh, um, aside from uh, uh, listing the evils, and it's a long list, um, What's your approach to actually changing things? And, and finally, I, I guess I have a dislike for slogans. And one of them is dismantling the police. Massive changes in policing, yes, bring them on. Uh, but I have to admit that when Trump tries to steal the election at polling places, I, I hope there are enough cops out there to stop him. Danae, should I respond to that first or? or um... Yeah, please feel free. Okay, um, thank you, Professor. Th those were all uh, really interesting uh, provocations that um, I'll try to do my best to, to respond to. Uh, on, the, on the first point about, you know, Massachusetts and California and and how difficult it is. I mean, I think for, for me, um, so many um, liberals uh, are, are operating under very uh, profound misunderstandings of what the criminal punishment system is doing and what interests it's serving and, and why and how and what's actually happening in it. And I think, um, I would, I would probably be a less effective messenger if I was trying to reach a lot of the right wing folks, although I, you know, have at times tried to engage with, with them because I, I do think that um, the criminal punishment bureaucracy is an affront to many of the values that they also claim that they hold. Um, and there's different approaches that we take with, with religious groups, with people who are interested in, in what they call uh, liberty. Um, uh, even though some of them have a pretty constrained notion of, of what liberty is. Um, uh, but like my focus has really been on the, the people who I think are, um, really movable. And I don't think we need that many of them. Um, I think it's, it's, for example, totally, uh, within our grasp 
um, in some of these more progressive minded states to help people have a more um, political analysis of um, our economy, our, our history of white supremacy and, and their connections to the criminal punishment bureaucracy. And I think if we, if we counter some of the incredible propaganda that people have been bombarded with for decades about the function of the criminal system, we can significantly reduce the size of the punishment bureaucracy in some of these places. Um, and I, I, I don't know, um, I think we, we still have a very, very difficult task ahead of us because the punishment bureaucracy is so intertwined with Democrat machine politics. Um, the unions that represent um, many of the, the bureaucrats who work in the system are quite powerful locally. Um, and I think there's a more sophisticated group of financial interests who understand very well the uh, role that the criminal punishment bureaucracy is playing in preserving some of the inequality that they benefit from. So I don't think it's going to be easy. Um, but I, I do believe that there are a, a significant number of ordinary people across this country who don't know what the, what the criminal system is doing in, its, in their name, don't, um, haven't, you know, had the benefit of um, understanding the, the, the history of that system. Um, I think that, that a, a lot of people read Michelle Alexander's book and were, were truly moved into, into a different place. And I think what we're seeing now with the Black Lives Matter movement and the movements around defunding the police is a similar um, uh, and further shift of people and, and where they are in terms of what they think the criminal punishment system is doing. I think we're at a, a new moment of possibility. Uh, but what I, I do think it's going to take is a multidisciplinary or cross-disciplinary um, attention to more leftist politics. Um, we, we, we can't reform the criminal punishment system in a this sort of bureaucratic, um, bipartisan way that a lot of philanthropists and, and politicians want to do. Like, it's just not the case that the Koch brothers are going to agree um, on the kinds of changes that we need. We need to ignore all of that stuff and organize around um, things that will, you know, like um, a right to housing, uh, universal health care, um, uh, the, the kinds of, of investments in communities that will at the same time build up um, uh, community relationships and connections and, and, and well-being and uh, reduce the, the, the use of the criminal punishment bureaucracy. So I think we need to connect the criminal stuff to a broader political fight is what I'm saying. And we need to make it a, uh, a part of sort of liberal um, and progressive um, thinking. And I don't. I just don't think it. it I, I don't think that's really been an intentional focus of the organizing um, until the last few years. Um, on your second question about the small list of of potential ideas, I, I do think that those ideas have enormous potential if they're done in in at scale. So, for example, um, in every single city in in town in this country. Uh, universities and local municipal governments, many of whom are, are, are controlled by progressive Democrats, are the biggest purchasers of um, landscaping services, laundry services, janitorial services, um, utility production, power and water. Um, there is no reason that um, those places, instead of giving those contracts to Aramark and other large corporations, that they couldn't set up worker-owned co-ops for people who live in heavily targeted communities, people who are returning home from prison, just like they're doing in Cleveland, right, with evergreen co-ops, and, and give those municipal contracts to um, those people. And, and at the same time, one of the things I like about worker-owned co-ops is that at the same time that people are building um, economic capital, they're also um, building political consciousness as workers in solidarity with each other. And uh, I'm, I'm tremendously excited about things like that. And I think it would, Democrats, the Democratic Party could decide right away this is a priority for them. And in every major city, in Pittsburgh and in Washington, D.C. and in Philadelphia and in Detroit, um, local governments could start giving these contracts to uh, worker-owned co-ops that are, that are run primarily by people who've been 
um, ex you know, experience the, the criminal punishment system. And I, I think that even doing that on a relatively small scale in a number of cities would so um, change people's um, mindset and approach to these issues um, that it would, I think, lead to a, a potential uh, revolution in, in, in how we think about um, like the, the role of government in, in um, investing in communities. Um, I also think that just very basic policies like universal health care would go a long way toward remedying a lot of the problems that we see in the criminal system. One of the big problems in the criminal system is it is the way that we deal with mental health crises right now. It just is. It's the only place where you can get funding for, for that. The, the largest mental health provider in most major American cities is the jail. And, and so massive investments away. And that's why one of the things that we've been trying to do, Professor, in, in a bunch of cities is you look at, let's say, like Houston, for example, which, which since the increase in the budget after the George Floyd murder um, uh, uh, is a $960 million Houston police budget. Um, there's another $560 million sheriff's budget in the same town. And then there's 60, six zero other municipal police forces. Um, so this is a, a city that alone, just on policing, not even talking about incarceration and, and prison, state prison expenditures, this city alone is spending several billion dollars a year on policing. One of the things we're trying to do is go into local teachers unions and nurses unions and, and um, writers and poetry collectives and others and say, this is money that should be going to you. Um, there is a direct transfer between um, not having after school poetry and theater and athletic programs for kids and having um, not enough teachers in our schools to all of the jail and prison guards and police officers that we're hiring and all of the military grade weaponry that we're funding. And as a political matter, what excites me is maybe for the first time getting a lot of these um, interests, these organized labor interests to understand that like um, there is a tremendous uh, amount of resources there for the taking and that it is actually a better use of, um, of resources from a public safety perspective to invest in, in things like teachers and treatment and um, athletics and art and music and, and, and all of these things um, in affordable housing. And, and so um, one of the things that we're starting to do that we haven't done before is map out the power interests. Who are the potentially powerful local groups and local politics that can confront the police unions? Um, where are the teachers unions? Where are the nurses unions? Um, where are the, the tenants associations and other forms of, uh, and how can we link all of these people together uh, in a, a broader narrative that isn't like abolish the police necessarily, right? Because as you mentioned, that might not be as, as um, people might not be ready for that yet, um, but it's in, uh, investing and divesting, right? This is um, a term that the Law for Black Lives and the Movement for Black Lives have, have really been pioneering for the last five years. Um, this concept of divesting from the things that cause us pain and investing in the things that help us flourish. And so, I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's, it's something that has been doing so much harm and so much evil for so long is going to be hard to dismantle and hard to, to change in a serious way. But I think some of the things on the list that I mentioned are small policy changes that could be done locally everywhere, have a bigger effect and give people a, a sense of imagination while building some of that solidarity that we're gonna need for these larger political fights. Um, your third question um, was, um, uh, I don't remember your third question. Um, I'm well, sorry. I, I just pointed out that, that um, you had to, uh, I think, the, the essence of it is that um, changing the police uh, function is very important, but um, talk about dismantling or doing away with doesn't really get, get us there, that's all. Right. And I, I, I guess what I'd like to know is, is just what you would do and what you would not do. Uh, sometimes uh, the rhetoric it gets a little ahead of the reality when we're talking about um, getting rid of prisons and police. And uh, despite the fact that enormous changes are called for as, as you do. I think that's a very important point. Let me just say 
the people who call themselves abolitionists, myself included, um, at least in my experience, um, they don't, they don't, they're not advocating that uh, we tomorrow eliminate all police forces and all prisons and we keep the society that looks exactly like it looks now, but without those things. I think really what they're saying is it's sort of a visionary uh, sort of long-term idea about what would it look like if we had a society that was so much more radically meeting people's needs that we didn't need those institutions and imagine that world and start building some of the, the relationships and the, the um, civil society infrastructure to create that kind of a world. And, and so um, I, I think that as a matter of like framing for the broader public, I don't think they understand what abolition is. And I, I agree with you that it may not be helpful um, to immediately right away start using that term with people because it's, it's such a vague concept. For me, I, I like to talk about it in a few ways. I like to use concrete examples and I like to sort of walk people through what it might look like. So for example, um, we may not, we, we can disagree about, you know, what to do about the most serious examples of people harming each other in our society. But 95% of all police arrests in this country are for things the FBI says are not serious violent crimes. Only 4% of all the time police officers spend on the job has to do with what police officers call violent crime. So over 90% of all of what they're doing is stuff that is unrelated to the main functions that they say to us that we need them for, protecting us against violent crime. So I find it really helpful to walk people through just what it is police are doing with all their time and their money. And when you actually walk people through it, most people think that much of it is unnecessary, okay? So the leading cause of arrest in many places around the country is driving on a suspended license. Most people don't think we need armed government agents on that problem. And 40% of all the suspended licenses are suspended because people owe debts, not because they're bad drivers. Um, there are more arrests for marijuana in this country than for all violent crime combined, right? Robbery, murder, sexual assault. Um, like most people don't support those kinds of law enforcement priorities. And so I like to walk through and say like, look, why don't we just start, let's, let, before we get to the hard stuff we might disagree about, let's agree to eliminate all these other things and use those resources to help um, communities. And once you start talking like that, I think the people start to imagine what it might look like in their community if instead of arresting everyone for these drug offenses, they had a whole new community center with theater programs for the kids and poetry and music and art festivals and things like that, that actually would, would connect people to each other. Or instead of um, everyone getting um, punished and, 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 and getting terrible medical care at the jail, we had um, beautiful new free medical clinics in every neighborhood, right? These are the kinds of, I just like to start using specific concrete examples of people instead of vague terms like abolition. But what an abolitionist world might look like is a world in which there was really great affordable housing and medical clinics and public transportation and all the things that, that, that people need to, to, to get by and to stay connected with each other. So the first answer is, let's just stop doing most of the stuff that we're currently doing that is causing a lot of pain um, and that has no conceivable benefit. Um, and then I think we get to this, this deeper conversation about um, like, what is, what is the, what is the best way um, to both one, minimize the number of circumstances where people harm each other, and two, when someone does harm someone else, because it will always happen to some degree. Um, it won't happen to the degree that we are currently doing it in this society if, if we had a healthier society. But how do we hold that person accountable in a way that um, is meaningful to both the person who's been harmed and the person who harmed them? And this is where I think a lot of the literature on restorative justice and transformative justice is very powerful because it helps people see that, in fact, for many societies around the world and, uh, and for many um, other, other societies throughout history, they haven't resorted to putting a human being in a cage when they harm someone. They've resorted to other things. So I, there's a, an amazing website that I think is really fantastic called transformharm.org. And that's a website curated by Maryam Kaba, K-A-B-A, 
Uh, it has podcasts and articles and documentaries and, um, and all kinds of resources about uh, re-envisioning how to protect, uh, how to prevent and, and respond to violence. And it, it's, it's quite a, um, a powerful resource for people. I'll stop there so we can get to the rest of the questions. Well, you have a large audience and I think we should hear from them. Thank you both. Um, going off of Professor Meltzner's question, it was actually a perfect segue for my first question of if we're applying the abolitionist framework, um, what is the first feasible step that you think we can take that would garner bipartisan support because we're so split right now as a country, I feel. And there's so many layers to abolition. Like, do we start with cash bail reform? Do we start with releasing everyone that's being held on marijuana charges? Where do we start in this corrupt criminal justice system to take the first step, step towards an abolitionist future? Well, in some ways, that's such a good question. Um, in some ways, I'm just precisely the wrong person to answer it as like a, you know, white male lawyer from fancy schools. And, um, you know, so I, I can say that having worked with a lot of organizers around the country and a lot of people who, who are directly impacted by this system, I think most people would say, the answer really depends, it might be different in different places. The answer sort of depends on what different communities think. Um, but, but by and large, my own assessment is that um, this country is probably ready politically for the system to do a tremendous amount, for the system to, to, to do a lot less harm. Um, so like, uh, yes, I mean, I, I think it would be, it's already, um, the majority view that people shouldn't be caged for marijuana possession. Um, that right there would eliminate the, the, the single largest cause of arrest in the US, right there. Um, and when we eliminate that, we should also take the money that police were spending on that and take that out of police budgets and put it into communities. That should be not controversial. And we should be, you know, in a lot of places, people are organizing around that. Cash bail is another one, although I'm a little wary of that because as I've mentioned, it's one thing to, to, and as Professor Meltzner said, you know, it's one thing to indict the system and to point out things that are obviously wrong, but it's another thing to have the power built up to actually replace it with something better. And I worry that in a lot of places, um, we're not ready to build it, to replace it with something better. We don't have the political power. Um, New York State just did really good cash bail reform that actually is gonna dramatically, it's gonna reduce the jail population by about 40 or 50% statewide, which is great. Um, but California did the opposite, you know, Massachusetts hasn't been able to do it either. So, um, you know, I think it's very local. The, the New York effort was successful because there's such amazing, powerful organizing over in, with relationships built over years. But there's also other reasons that, you know, for, for hope, you know, the Justice LA coalition of organizers um, blocked the construction of a billion dollar new jail um, just last year. And and they taking the power that they built in that and they've produced an amazing document which you guys should check out it's called like the people's budget and they have a huge budget reports um, that local black lives matter and, and justice um, la organizers have they've basically taken the city of los angeles budget and shown what it currently is and what everything is being spent on and what it should be spent on to help communities and it includes like line item things like dramatic reductions to the probation office and like corresponding, you know, you know, increases in um, social work uh, assistance for people. Like it's a really beautiful document that people can organize around in Los Angeles. And so I think one thing that in answer to your question that comes to my mind is like people in their communities everywhere should be doing that because their local budgets are moral documents. It's where the community says what we prioritize and what we don't prioritize. And so I think that people should follow the lead of the Justice LA organizers in, in each of their local communities and actually um, working with the people who are most affected by this stuff and producing a, a moral document that says 
what they want for their community and what they prioritize instead of uh, what we're currently doing. So that being said, do you think that change is more promising and quicker to happen at the local level than it is the state or the federal? I think that um, mass incarceration um, is the levers of mass incarceration are really controlled at the local level. And as much as the Democratic Party um, in the 90s sort of made it a priority to invest in policing and, and you know, putting 100 to 150,000 new cops on the street um, after Clinton's 94 crime bill and Biden's amendments to it in the early 2000s. Um, like, so there has been federal, I mean, there is a, a significant federal role, right, still, but um, the vast majority of, of, of arrests and prosecutions and policy decisions are made on a local level. And um, I also think it's much easier to organize people around local campaigns and local um, community relationships than it is to organize big federal change. Uh, that being said, you know, we have worked really closely with the Movement for Black Lives um, over the last few months to help create something called the BREATHE Act, B-R-E-A-T-H-E, that was unveiled um, last week. And it's a visionary document that is actually a piece of federal legislation that would transform the American criminal system. And um, it's something that, um, you know, hopefully will be introduced by some, by, you know, Ayanna Presley or, or, or Ocasio-Cortez or some member of the, the squad soon. Um, I'm, I'm not actually um, sure exactly what's going on, but, um, you know, Patrice Cullors did a, a really amazing um, unveiling of this bill last week that I suggest you check out. And there's, and the BREATHE Act is going to spawn a number of local versions of the BREATHE Act. Um, what would it look like for local governments to pass legislation uh, that is consistent with the, with the it, it, divestment and investment framework of the BREATHE Act? And so we actually are producing real blueprints for, you know, and, and it gets into, to, you know, minute details, like um, how do we prevent local governments from doing search warrant raids, like the one that killed Breonna Taylor? Um, how do we prevent local governments from increasing the size of their jail population? How do we enact real significant policies that decrease the jail population? And, and that's kind of an exciting project that, that the Movement for Black Lives is really leading and that I think, um, you know, is, is, is both national and like a, an entree point for local organizers to, to, to build their own version of the BREATHE Act, which we're gonna try to help, help people with. Incredible, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and read questions from the audience. And the first one is, can you talk about voting when there is no good candidate? Um, does voting legitimatize a white supremacist system and ultimately support this pillar? Or is voting a bare minimum that we do only to combat the lesser of two evils? Ooh, what a hard question. Um, let me dodge the question um, a little bit and just say something that I think is most important about this issue. Because I, I, have, I have very passionate friends on both sides of this question about whether, whether voting just legitimates um, the system and, and gives people the illusion that we live in a democracy when we really don't. Um, and other friends who, who acknowledge all of that but say, um, still, um, like, it's, it, the question is vote and what else are you going to be doing, right? Um, so there's a, there's a, a vibrant debate. Um, let me just say that um, I find the the focus on voting in our society, political voting, to be bizarre. Um, it's, you know, especially in liberal circles, um, the quickest way to be disinvited to a dinner party or to be um, stigmatized and, and um, ostracized is to say something like what this person asking the question said, right? To, to suggest that you don't think voting is all that important. Um, I don't even think we need to get into that fight to understand the much more important point, which is that far more important than 
than what you do uh, on the day of, of whether you spend five minutes to cast your ballot or not, um, is what are you doing in between to build power? Because the, the interests in our society that have real power are the ones who get whatever they want, no matter who's in power, Democrat or Republican, in this bipartisan system. This is why we've seen the military industrial complex grow um, significantly under every administration. This is why in every single local government, whether it's controlled by Democrats or Republicans, the police budget has increased for 40 years. Real power is, is, is that kind of organization that demands that whoever is in power listen to it because they won't be in power if they don't listen to it anymore. Um, real power is the people, the property and real estate developers who control most major decisions in most major American cities. Um, th the people who own things, right? So what are the ways in which we build connections with each other, organize um, uh, outside of the context of the voting every two years or four years, I think is actually the, the, the thing people should be asking themselves. And people should be, um, in addition to stigmatizing people for not voting, he should be stigmatizing people who are not, um, you know, learning about the horrors of these systems and working in, in their own way with whatever skills and whatever. People have a, a variety of different limitations, physical and, 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 and other constraints. Um, so I'm not saying everyone needs to be doing the same thing or everyone needs to be getting out there uh, uh, in the streets, but there is a role for all of us to be playing um, every, every minute of every day in fighting these systems. And it's not enough to just vote for the lesser of two evils every two or four years. The second thing I'll say that, that baffles me about the focus on voting is that we're focusing, in my opinion, on voting in the wrong format. We should be democratizing our economy and democratizing the workplace. Um, so people should be voting to unionize and voting to form worker-owned co-ops. Um, and I guarantee you, that if all of these private corporations turn into worker-owned co-ops and if all of them turn into unionized workplaces, the political results that you all want, people who, who support you know, liberal voting, they're going to flow from that automatically um, because we're going to dramatically change the ownership of things in our society. Um, and so to me, it's much more important. To, like, What if instead of spending a billion dollars in this election cycle on these ludicrous middle-of-the-road candidates in much of the country and these political ads, what if we spent that on actually organizing people to unionize? Um, I bet you the result would be a, a much more progressive and much more organized um, political uh, party uh, for the Democrats. So even on the, even if you were a Democrat um, and if you're interested in, in, in voting, um, it seems to me that you should also be focused really significantly on, and you're, if you're interested in democracy, you should be interested in democratizing the workplace and democratizing the ownership of things in our society. Because it's always, in my opinion, been uh, the, the, a, a really strange system that privileges a uh, so-called um, political democracy over uh, an economic democracy, even when all of the evidence suggests that um, a truly democratic political system is impossible when you have such a, a wide divergence of wealth. It's just not possible when Jeff Bezos is worth $200 billion to have a system where he doesn't have outsized influence. So the, the economic and the political are so connected. And so that's what I think about when I think of voting. Great. Thank you so much. And the next question is, what is your opinion on the role that lawyers can play in breaking down a system that they're a part of? Great question. Again, I think we're all struggling to figure that out in our own way. And the answer is probably different for different lawyers in different fields. Um, what I will say is that um, lawyers are often taught in school and when they read you know, the, the great cases of, of the US tradition um, that like the case is what did that really good thing. Like, Brown versus Board of Education is what, um, you know, desegregated the schools. There's a, there's a real um, bias toward like the role and power of lawyers and judges. And I just think all of that is like basically wrong. Number one, Brown versus Board of Education would never have been decided in the way that it was if it hadn't been for a huge social movement um, that made the court understand it had to rule that way unanimously. Number two, 
you can win all the legal cases you want. You can even win Brown versus Board of Education. It doesn't mean that schools are actually going to be desegregated. Um, we're 60 years after Brown, and in many places, schools are more segregated than they were before Brown. So lawyers, I think, fundamentally misunderstand sometimes that the, their role as a lawyer um, is uh, to try to figure out a way to use the legal system as a small part of a social movement that is led by other people. Now, it may be led by some people who happen to also be lawyers, but they're not leading that movement as lawyers qua lawyers. They're leading that movement as an ordinary person in society who's coming together and organizing with other people. So, um, you know, I, I, I often think about um, what that means for our work. And I think we can do a few different things. One, we can try to make the system less cruel for our clients, you know, and it matters that we got 17 or 18,000 people out of jail every single year in Houston alone with our bail case there. That's, that's important. Um, but what also matters is that the way we litigated that case, our partnership with the community organizers, our use of the videos and the stories of our clients with those organizers to do public education and training, and then the role that those organizers played in using those stories to recruit a slate of new public officials, prosecutor, sheriff, and judges. They unseated all of the judges that opposed us in our lawsuit. And that's how we ended up settling the case because organizers recruited different people to run. They built a campaign around it. And then they, they, and that wasn't anything that lawyers did, right? But it was the bail case created the space for organizers to make bail a really big issue in that election and then to go door to door in the community and educate people about the bail system. And, and so one of the things that our cases can do is we can draw a lot more attention to something like the cash bail system and we can help organizers and academics and others around the country pose a really profound question to our society, which is if this is how our society is deciding who's in jail and who's not, how do we trust anything else the criminal punishment system is doing? If it's deciding who's in a cage and who's away from her family on the basis of access to cash. And that's not really the role of a lawyer to like pose that broader public question and to organize around it, but it is, it is something that's made possible in a small way by the fact that we're bringing legal cases about it. Um, so, you know, there's many other ways lawyers can, can function. They can represent people when um, activists are targeted. Um, they can um, use their legal cases to gain information, access to information and discovery that people haven't been able to figure out before. Um, they can win cases that um, create a moment for um, work. To, so another thing that we did was we brought a bunch of cases on behalf of people who are trapped in jails during COVID. And our clients, you know, wrote these declarations from the jail about what they were enduring. And one thing that we did was we then gave it to a team of artists and journalists and they produced an incredible um, website that has all these famous artists like um, Fiona Apple and Alec Baldwin and um, Jesse Williams and you know, Sherilyn Eiffel and other people who, have, who are really prominent sort of cultural figures um, reading the declarations of our jailed clients about what's going on in their jail cells. This isn't like a thing that we're doing in court Right, but it, it's made possible by the work of lawyers to file that lawsuit and collect those declarations and affidavits from the jail cells and then using them and then having people with big public artistic platforms. We also had a, um, uh, a Broadway actors group uh, dr dramatize and create monologues based on some of these declarations and read them out on Instagram. And you know, there's, there's all kinds of different, you know, we at Civil Rights Corps have an artist in residence and a poet in residence at our organization who are both formerly incarcerated individuals. Every year we have a different person um, in that position in our organization. Um, and the, role, the, the goal is to help our lawyers understand um, like other media, other ways of telling these same stories that don't involve legal court cases and legal jargon. Um, and, to, and to be giving some artists and other cultural influencers some of the, the stories and ideas and legal concepts that they can use in their own work that, and all of it is, is part of a broader goal to, to be a small part of a cultural movement. Thank you, Alec. 
Um, thanks for the reminder also that we have so much we can do with this JD and it's really a tool that we can use to dismantle the system. I know I often get so overwhelmed because I feel it's this big giant system that how are we going to dismantle and I get really discouraged um, thinking my JD sometimes isn't enough, but I appreciate the breakdown of all the different ways that we can use our degree to affect change. Um, and I'll lead to our last question, which is, what are a few of the most promising changes regarding policing, prosecution, incarceration that you've seen around the country and ideas that we should try to replicate elsewhere? Ooh, um, questions like this are very difficult for, for me to answer because I, I see so little that is promising um, right now. Um, one of the reasons I was inspired to write the book and then the article that Rachel posted in the chat, which is really a follow-up to the book um, written after the, the murder of George Floyd, um, is that I think the people who control our punishment bureaucracy have so far prevented really most meaningful changes from occurring. But I will give you a couple of examples just so that I don't leave on such a down note. Um, one thing I mentioned a little bit, what is the New York bail law? The New York bail law does something that I mentioned at the, in the first essay in the book, which is very important. Um, and this is one of the ways that you can judge whether a reform is a good kind of reform or a bad kind of reform. It reduces the power and discretion of punishment bureaucrats to even consider money bail or pretrial detention in most cases. One of the key principles that I've learned over the years is if you build it, they will come. And if you allow judges and prosecutors and probation officers in the system uh, and police discretion, they're going to use that discretion in ways that serve the interests that control the criminal system. So one of the very key pieces that organizers got into the New York bill was if you're charged with most of types of offenses, you, they can't even think about detaining you. They must release you. And that is so important. And, and a lot of people who don't do this work think, what's the difference between the word may and the word shall in a piece of legislation? Like the judge may release you pretrial. It's so different from the judge shall release you, right? The judge may release you leads to detention of 70 or 80% of people. The judge shall release you releases everybody, right? Um, and so that, that reform was very promising. There was a a huge blowback by the prosecutor and police lobby, and they succeeded in rolling back a little bit of the New York bail law. But even in its rolled back form, it's by far the best bail law in the country and will lead to dramatic uh, decreases. And what's so important about that is these systems become more powerful the bigger they get, and they become less powerful the smaller they get. So the smaller you make the system, the fewer people whose jobs depend on it, the fewer people who are making money off of it the less political power they're gonna to have to influence what goes on next. And that's another reason why I'm so interested in finding ways that we can empower um, nurses, and so nurses and social health, um, social workers and home health aides and teachers to um, understand that like, there's a lot of, of money and jobs at stake in these fights for them. And, and that's promising to me, um, alliances between different types of labor. Another thing that I, I mentioned a few of in the, I, I mentioned earlier the worker owned co-ops in Cleveland uh, as just an example. Um, some of the places that are reserving marijuana licenses for people who've been convicted of marijuana offenses or heavily policed communities. Um, that's really promising. There's another uh, organization that I think is absolutely amazing. It's called Success Stories. And this is started by one of the most charismatic people I've, I've really ever encountered. Um, uh, his, there's a great documentary for free on CNN called The Feminist on Cell Block Y. And um, Richie, the, the guy who started this organization, when he was in prison in California, he spent years organizing to create a feminist reading group inside California state prisons. And the theory behind this project was that um, the root of most violence in our culture is toxic masculinity. And 
if we can, and so he has like huge groups of people that get together and read bell hooks and sort of talk about, talk about it. And um, when, when uh, people go through the program, they then become the facilitators for the next year's program. And now that Richie is out of prison, whenever people get out of prison who went through the program, he hires them to facilitate in other places. And this is, you know, in response to Professor Meltzner's um, point earlier, this is actually what abolition looks like. Because Richie's theory is that um, we don't need to put people in a cage or to punish them um, when they've harmed someone. Um, we can address violence and the mentality that creates it. Yes, through all the economic and other things that I talked about earlier, but through confronting and addressing um, and learning about in a restorative setting about toxic masculinity. And that's his theory, right? Um, I'm not saying that Richie's one program is the panacea to all our social evils, but I am saying that there are people like Richie who are developing non-carceral alternatives to responding to violence. And it's working, right? A lot of these, a lot of these programs have astronomically low recidivism rates. Um, so things like that give me a lot of hope. Um, there are people um, working on programs just like that all over. Thank you, Alex. Um, that concludes our event for today. Thank you all for joining us and thank a special thank you to you, Alec, and Professor Melchner for taking time out of your schedules to be here with us today. Thank you for all the insight into the system that you've given us and all the little tidbits of promise and hope for us when using our JDs moving forward to just like you, dismantle the criminal justice system. So thanks again. Thank you. I want to thank. Um, thank you, Alex, also. for your work. Thank you for your work. Yeah, thank you, Professor, for taking the time. It's, it's really an honor to meet you. Um, and Danae, thank you and, and Balsa for opening the space up for, for, for someone like me to, to uh, you know, share my thoughts about these systems. And, and I hope it's been useful for you and the other students. Absolutely. Thank you. Keep on trucking. <laughs>